In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. <coughs> Good. Okay, um, we're going to pick off or pick up where we left off. Um, we're still in lesson four. Um, lesson four started a discussion of of a more theological nature, kind of the theological themes. Uh, the first three lessons were more historical. Um, a lot of what we say uh, today um, will be a bit of review and maybe a bit more uh, in depth because uh, we touched on some of the <coughs> theological topics already when they came up in the history of the Reformation. Um, but now we're going to focus uh, specifically on those uh, theological themes. So uh, we're in, um, like I said, um, lesson four. And one of the major themes of the Reformation was a re-understanding of the grace of God. Um, that grace was not something you handed out to people, um, but grace was the disposition of God toward you. And that was uh, really a, a, a different understanding um, than what uh, the common person in the Roman Catholic Church <clears throat> believed at that time. Um, it made the, the, oh, I'm sorry. Is that better? No? Hello? No? No, can you? No, oh, now you can hear me. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, one of the, uh, the the changes that the Reformation brought was a, a new understanding of the grace of God, that it was a God's disposition toward you and not something that the priest could hand out um, from, from this treasury of merit, right? Uh, and so uh, we're talking about the grace of God kind of hand in hand with how you talk about the grace of God, you also need to talk about the righteousness of God. Um, they really do go hand in hand. And that was a real uh, struggle, um, particularly for Martin Luther. Um, oh, come on. There we go. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about Luther and the righteousness of God. Um, in Luther's day, the Catholic Church really didn't have any clear teaching on the righteousness of God. It was just kind of, kind of a de facto way of doing things, right? Um, a lot of people, including Luther, really struggled to understand what the righteousness of God meant. Um, when Luther was younger, in his younger days, as when he was still a, a Roman Catholic priest, um, he interpreted God's righteousness as God's a complete and impartial dealings with man. So he, God was like a righteous judge, and he would be complete and impartial. But that made Luther um, really concerned, because who can stand under God's judgment? God is perfectly righteous, and who can stand under that? Um, at the time, the Roman Catholic idea was you can earn a small amount of merit yourself, and then if God saw that you were earning that merit, God would give you the rest um, as a gift of, of his grace, right? Um, so you would go a little ways, God would take care of the rest. Um, in around 1515, this, that'd be about seven years before he nailed the 95 Theses um, on the door of the Church of Wittenberg. Um, Around 1515, he really uh, wrestled with that um, because he realized he couldn't even produce that little small amount of merit um, uh, that God would uh, see and then give the rest, right? Um, he knew that if, if there was any precondition for his salvation that depended on what he did, um, he was in trouble. Um, but then Luther discovered Augustine. Um, remember Erasmus translated a lot of the early church fathers as well, including Augustine. And he realized um, he was trapped in sin, dead in sin, and he could only be saved by God's actions. And that was really a breakthrough uh, in the Reformation. 
um, uh, it was a re-understanding of that a righteousness of God that was totally dependent on the grace of God. Um, God meets all of those necessary preconditions. Luther didn't have to meet them himself. Um, and we uh, uh, claim that righteousness by faith, which itself is a gift of God. Right? Um, so uh, Luther made a number of contributions. Um, not only did he kind of re have a new understanding of grace and righteousness, he also had a new understanding of faith. And he made a number of contributions as he was working through that. Um, faith goes beyond just a knowledge of what Christ did in history. Um, it, it also includes this personal commitment, right? Um, it's, it's a commitment of the heart, um, not just a, 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 a historical knowledge, right? Um, so uh, uh, he would say faith is personal <clears throat> rather than simply historical. Now, there can be some historical elements in, in it. Um, there are those who know the day they were converted. Augustine was one. Um, he knew the day that he was converted, even the hour. He could go back to the hour when he was converted. Right? Um, but, but there's that personal characteristic of faith. And Luther um, understood that and communicated that to others. Um, he also uh, said, faith is a trust in the promises of God. Um, faith acted on those promises. Luther spoke of faith uh, kind of like if someone um, who, wants, who wants to cross an ocean. Uh, if you want to cross the ocean, you need a ship. And uh, you can see the ship in front of you, but you'll only step onto that ship if you know that if you put the weight on that ship, that boat is that ship is gonna gonna hold you up. If it falls apart, you're in trouble, right? Um, and he said, Luther said, the same way the believer has to have faith in what he called the ship of Christ, right? Um, faith acts on the belief, faith steps on that ship, um, but Christ is the ship that holds him up, all right? Um, so that's uh, another contribution that he made. He also said. I need to, I don't know, I'm getting all kinds of uh, things here. Let me uh, put do not disturb on. Sorry about that. <laughs> I had a, uh, a brother who was a professor at Purdue University, and he had a rule that if your cell phone went off during class, you owed a, you owed a treat. Uh, you had to give donuts the next day to uh, the whole class. Okay, wait, wait. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> I don't have money. <laughs> well, the, the day after he said that, his cell phone went off, so he had to give donuts <laughs> to the class. <laughs> so, anyway, glad we don't have that rule. <laughs> All right, let's let's continue. Um, Luther also said, um, "Faith, faith does not depend." Hang on. back here. Faith does not depend on man's strength. Um, uh, to believe the promises of God. It depends on the reliability of God to fulfill the promises. In other words, you can put it this way. It's not the greatness of your faith that matters. It's the greatness of God. He's the one who gives the faith. He's the one who holds his promises and fulfills his promises. Uh, Luther also said faith unites a believer to Christ. He compared it to marriage. Christ is united to his bride, the church. That's, that's a, a comparison we have. That's a biblical comparison, right? Um, he said, Luther said, in marriage, 
a husband and wife share all things. And it's the same way between a believer and Christ. Christ imparts his righteousness to the believer. The believer lays his sins at the feet of Christ. All right. So what's Christ is ours. The sin that is ours becomes Christ. He takes care of the sin. He said uh, also, in faith, the whole man turns to God and Christ reveals himself. It's not just introducing himself to the believer. Christ reveals all of his benefits to the believer. And in faith, the believer receives all those benefits through faith in Christ. Um, so we are one with Christ in that way. Another way he put that was to know Christ is to know his benefits. Calvin uh, went even further and said that Christians are engrafted into Christ's body. Christ made people partakers, not only of his benefits, but of himself. Another uh, change of understanding um, is that faith is not a human work. The Roman Catholic Church, you did those initial works in your faith, and God supplied the rest. In the Reformation with the Reformers, with Luther, and with the other Reformers as well, um, that was different. Faith is not a human work. Um, we're not justified due to our working enough faith in our hearts. Um, rather, faith is a gift of God. All right. If faith is not a human work, is there any place for works in the Reformed understanding of the Christian life? Um, there are many people, and we, we touched on this before, but there are many people who uh, claim that Luther really didn't like works at all. In fact, uh, many people claimed that Luther was antinomian against the law altogether. Um, so we need to talk about that uh, in a little bit more depth as well. Um, many saw Luther as antinomian. Um, and Luther did stress faith alone, right? Sola fide, right? Um, and he seemed to be speaking against works. In fact, in some of his more unguarded moments, um, he may have spoke of maybe even a little too harshly regarding works. Um, but that was one of the, the sticking points with the, with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, the, the faith um, that they required was a work. Um, in the Roman Catholic Church. And so he really reacted very strongly against that, right? Um, but Luther, Luther said, um, faith was not a product of good works, but he flipped it around and said, good works are a product of faith or a fruit of faith. Later on, Calvin is going to develop this thought with his concept of duplex gratia, or double grace. And that, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but just for now, uh, double grace refers to the, the theological tension between justification and sanctification. Um, the reformers were still kind of working that out. What is involved in justification? What is involved in sanctification? And so they, they 
they kind of had to wait for Calvin to, to really uh, come up with a, a solid understanding of the distinction between justification and sanctification. Right? Um, but they did start out, um, particularly uh, with Luther, um, they had a, a strong understanding of justification, and then they had to figure out how sanctification fit in with that, right? Um, <clears throat> for the reformers, we talk about the uh, concept of, of forensic justification. A little background. A forensic justification means legal justification, right? Um, Augustine had kind of an idea of this, but it was an idea that he had to work out a little bit more clearly, all right? Augustine taught that, man, that God gives man inward righteousness and declares him to be righteous. He taught that this righteousness was a free gift of God, where God places his righteousness within a believer. So that's Augustine. Um, the righteousness then becomes part of the believer and the believer is declared righteous while at the same time, God is internally changing the believer to be righteous. So Augustine had kind of the seeds of justification and sanctification in what he said, um, but it was just the seeds. It, was, it still needed a lot of growing to do, all right? Um, for Augustine, justification was a matter of being made righteous. He said, first God shows his grace, he declares the believer to be righteous, and then the believer begins a process of being changed to be in, internally righteous. So he kind of saw that all as one thing. Um, later, Luther comes around and he's going to refine what Augustine said. Um, Luther develops the idea of legal external righteousness, this idea of forensic justification. Um, what uh, Luther called it an alien righteousness. It's a righteousness from outside ourselves. It's foreign to us, really, but it's, it's laid on us. So um, he spoke of two kinds of righteousness. <clears throat> Inward and outward. He said the first kind of righteousness is this inward righteousness or our righteousness, as he put it, quorum Deo, in the presence of God, All right? Um, it's given as a gift of God, um, but it, it kind of, it remains outside the believer. It's, it, it, it's laid on top of, of the believer, right, who is still a sinner. It's an alien righteousness. Um, the sinner remained a sinner for Luther. The second kind of righteousness then was outward. Um, and that was a righteousness, he said, quorum mundo. Um, so the inward was quorum deo, the outward was quorum mundo, um, which is righteousness in the eyes of the world. It's a righteousness that people can see. And he said the believer works out that kind of righteousness in his life. Um, the believer is gradually transformed, and he's becoming increasingly righteous. So, by saying that there's the, the, believe, the believer has both inward and outward righteousness, one that is just laid on top of him, and one that he works out in his life and that people can see, he was really saying that sin and righteousness can coexist in a believer. We're getting closer. To an understanding of justification and sanctification. Um, I'm just wondering if yeah. this was before or before or after he said that James, the epistle to James, is uh, kind of uh, not he that, he that, he didn't, that he didn't like the epistle of James. Yeah. He didn't want it to be part of the of the New Testament canon. Um, I'm not sure if if this was before or after. I, 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 I always assumed that his his comment about James was made fairly late in in his ministry, so this has probably worked out even before that. Yeah, but I don't know. 
Uh, I don't know for sure. Yes. So you, you can see um, from Augustine to Luther, um, there's this understanding uh, kind of a, in, in seed form of what justification is and what sanctification is. Um, but they still don't have the terms that they're defining it. They're still working it out. Uh, Luther leaned on Augustine to kind of work things out. Um, later, um, uh, after uh, Luther, Melanchthon, um, Luther's heir, um, refined Luther's position even a little bit more. So Melanchthon uh, developed the idea of an external forensic righteousness. He's the one who really used the term, first used the term forensic, even though it's really part of Lutheran ideas already. Um, he taught that the sinner is not made righteous, but is accounted righteous because of Christ's righteousness imputed to him. Um, this idea of imputed righteousness is something that um, Melanchthon came up with. It's a change from Augustine's thinking. Um, Augustine said you were made internally righteous. And Melanchthon is saying the righteousness you have is Christ's righteousness imputed to you. That idea of imputed righteousness from, from that point on was what all of the reformers agreed on. Um, that uh, Christ imputes his righteousness to us. Uh, it's, it's the great exchange, right? Christ gives us his righteousness, we give Christ our sin, right? Yeah. So, so uh, obviously that doctrine is not present, it's not emphasized in the medieval, right. but would you, could we also say that even in the early church this was not yet developed? Exactly, um, because Augustine developed it probably the, the most of any of the ancient church fathers, mm -hmm. and his understanding was still kind of in, in seed form. It, it wasn't fully developed at that point yet. Yeah. It's just interesting that it took that long. So. Yes, it is. Um, and if you study you know, theology in seminary or so, uh, you, you wonder sometimes uh, the, the the technical terms that they use, like imputed righteousness, and so it's, yeah. it it can sound very technical. Um, but in the in the way that it was developed, uh, they they drew very fine lines as far as what is justification, what is sanctification, and so they used a very explicit terminology to help define that even further. So that's that's what happened. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. Oh. Technically, uh, right now, when like when people say that they, they embrace reform theo theology, but as 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 we look at uh, history, uh, it's like you have to be specific which one, because like this one, Augustine, Luther, and Melanchthon, they differ. So so what when I say I I embrace reform theology. But I have to be specific which one of those theologies. <laughs> and if you look at uh, the rest of the reformers, there are differences. We, we have studied from that, that, uh, the two days that they, they have all different differences. So when, when, when someone today say that I embrace reformed theology, then maybe we'll say, which one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, is, it is quite possible uh, that that would be a legitimate question to ask, which one? Yeah. Because we, we talk about Reformed theology, um, there are some people who limit Reformed theology to the Candace of Dorks, you know, the tulip. Um, um, but, but Reformed theology is much broader than that. Really, Reformed theology, in my mind, um, refers to the theology that, that was developed during the Reformation, right, that came out of the Reformation. But you, you're absolutely right. There were different strains of that. Um, Lutheran theology is different than what we now call Reformed theology, but they're really both part of the Reformation, right? So you really, to use the term Reformed is, is probably too broad yeah. to, to be of a lot of use. <laughs> yeah, um, I would prefer to say Biblical. 
that's me. Yeah. Uh, during the like seventeen uh, hundreds, uh, was there already a, a refined like this is this is the only reformed teachings? Uh, when when Calvin came along and published um, his second edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, um, that probably um, solidified Calvin's position as kind of uh, the main theologian of the Reformation. And so um, even today, the word reform very often is used to signify just those churches that kind of fall under Calvin's umbrella. Um, and so um, a Lutheran today probably wouldn't call himself Reformed, even though he's a Lutheran is a child of the Reformation as well. Um, and same thing with Armenian uh, churches. Um, they're also part of the Reformation, um, even though it kind of settled on Calvin just because he was kind of the main theologian and articulated everything um, in, in much greater detail than, than others. So, so the official, the official reform a Calvinist. <laughs> you know, uh, that's where the that's where the term usually lands. Is if you reformed, you you identify with the theology of, of John Calvin. But to me, the, the Reformation is much broader than that. There's a lot of things, more things that are going on. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's also you cannot you, you always have to tie it up with ecclesiology with how. How churches is, is, is function, done, how functions. Mm -hmm. So it, it also the church government is also involved in how well, how the the reformers. Because one of the things that they fought against was the hierarchical uh, form of government. So right. if we still go back to that, then we're not following the <laughs> reform the uh, yeah the reform way. If we go we still go back to the hierarchical uh, form. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's uh, talk about just a few more people. Um, we talked about Melanchthon and his idea of imputed righteousness. Um, that was um, something that all the reformers uh, uh, figured. Melanchthon got it right, and uh, they all uh, claimed uh, that to be a solid theological point. All right. Um, Zwingli at first. Uh, Zwingli just stressed the need to follow Christ's examples. Um, he was he was a very practical kind of theologian, right? Um, do the do righteous and holy acts. Um, later, uh, Zwingli kind of followed uh, Luther's stress on justification, but he didn't have as de as developed an idea of the difference between justification and sanctification. It was just do the right things, do holy things, right? Um, and let's talk just a little bit about Calvin. And um, his idea of duplex gratia or double grace. Calvin's position on duplex gratia ultimately became the standard position of all the later reformers. So it's kind of like Melanchthon's idea of imputed righteousness. It was it was more broadly held. Um, it's later reflected in a lot of reformed creeds and confessions, Belgian Confession, Westminster Standards, <coughs> Westminster Confession. Um, and so it's reflected in, in that. Calvin taught that Christians are united by in, to Christ by faith. And that union leads to their gaining what he called duplex gratia or a double grace. Um, by justification and by inward renewal, what we would call sanctification. So there's two ways that, that God shows his grace to us. One way through justification, one way through sanctification. Um, in, your, in the course materials, Dr. Zug uh, summarized Calvin's <clears throat> teaching on duplex gratia with three um, propositions. First one, faith unites someone to Christ. It's by faith that the believer enters into a personal relationship with Christ himself. 
Second proposition. Christians are declared righteous due to the righteousness of Christ. It's not anything we've done. Um, this is the idea of, of Melanchthon's idea of imputed righteousness, right? The righteousness is put upon us. And then the third Um, due to union with Christ, God's people are also regenerated. And so begin a process of becoming holy eternally. <coughs> Up until this point, this idea of righteousness, are we righteous or are we not, was, the thinking was kind of muddy. But uh, after Calvin uh, set out all of these examples, we have a, a very distinct understanding of what justification is and what sanctification is. Justification is a once for all imputed righteousness. We are declared righteous before Christ. Nothing more needs to be done. At the same time, uh, we begin the process of sanctification, where our outward acts uh, become more and more holy every day. We're more and more set apart uh, in union with Christ. Um, and those <coughs> justification and sanctification can exist together. Right? Sir? Yes? Is that uh, the same? Uh, is, is that uh, the view? The same with, uh, I don't know if it's true, but I read somewhere that it's, that it's a Jewish thinking of the old nature and the new nature. They're, they're like dogs, white and black, within the man. And uh, is it the same with the reformers' view? Um, well, with the process of sanctification, I, I could see, I, I have not heard of that example, but I could see where that would make, make sense. Where, as Paul said, um, the old man of sin, we still struggle with, even though we are a new creation, right? Um, and that's that's the struggle of sanctification. Yeah. Um, even though we are fully justified as we go about that process of sanctification. It's a process. Yes. It's a process. Sanctification is a process. Justification, one time, one yeah. act. You can never be more sanctified today I mean, to, more justified. Yeah, you, you can never be more justified right. uh, today than, than, than yesterday. Or, but your sanctification grow. Exactly. Your sanctification should grow. Should grow. <laughs> should grow. Sometimes it, yeah, it's got peaks and valleys. We all, we all know that, right? Um, but as we uh, are more and more one with Christ, um, we become uh, more united to him and more set apart for his work. And there's a comment here to somebody's uh, listening to us. Yeah. Um, kind of, so one God exists without another. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you are justified, you will be going about the process of sanctification. Yeah. And you really can't even start that process, process of sanctification until justification. It, it may appear that the, the person is growing in sanctification, but if uh, sanctification did not happen. That's that's not that's in, in the eyes it, of God. It, it's easy to fake being a Christian, that's right? right. <laughs> uh, we know that. Um, yeah. There are wolves among the sheep, and it's it's easy um, to do that. But that but that's not true sanctification. Then uh, I would argue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, good questions. Any other questions or comments about uh, that idea of righteousness, sir? Yes. Other uh, reform, I think they would, would speak about uh, sin as mm -hmm. um, the remains, the remains of the old man. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a development, or that's the is the standard view of the reform concerning sin and and right and righteousness from that? Uh, 
Yeah, that goes all the way back to Pauline theology. And so um, it probably was recovered by the reformers, um, but it's, it's a solid biblical concept that we struggle with the old medicine, even though we're part of the new creation. Yeah. Um, it's, it's the whole idea of Pauline eschatology, right? Um, I don't know if I can, if I can write that out. Um, With, with the Jews of Jesus' day, they thought there was a creation, and, it, and then there's the old creation. And then Jesus came. And I'm going to say his first coming. And the Jews thought that this would be the new creation. Um, once the Messiah came, the new creation would come. Um, when Christ came, uh, he had a bit of a different, so they would say, they would say new creation. When Christ came, um, and when Paul later explained this, um, it looked a little bit different than that. Um, we still had creation. We had the old creation. But when Christ came the first time, this old creation continued, even as the new creation was also present. So Paul said, you are a new creation right now. And so this would be the old creation. This would be Christ's first coming. This will be his second coming. And we're somewhere on this line right here, yeah. right? Yeah. We're still in the world, but we're not out of the world. Um, we fight with the old man of sin, even though we are a new creation already. Right? The seed are seen. Yeah. The seed are seen. Yeah. yeah. The seeding seen. Yeah. So one day, when Christ comes again, that's when the old creation will no longer be. And we will have a new heaven and a new earth in the new creation, right? So that's what, uh, and that's a, that's a Pauline eschatology. That's, and so that's um, really the, how um, how Paul worked it out, um, and how uh, the reformers really rediscovered that. All right, good question. Thank you, sir. <laughs> right. Any other questions or comments about that? I'm going to clear this and want to also talk about, oops, hang on. Uh, you knew it was coming, right? <laughs> We need to talk a little bit about um, predestination. Is everybody in the room? <laughs> everybody still here? <laughs> okay, give me some background. Augustine taught that man's sinful nature flowed from Adam. So Augustine taught original sin. And that was really came out of his um, conflict with Pelagius. Pelagius denied original sin. Augustine taught it. Right? Augustine said, we're born dead in sin. And in order to save men, God first had to overcome man's sinfulness. He had to turn our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Ezekiel 36. Right? In that process of God turning hearts of stone into hearts of flesh, God shows grazing, uh, saving grace to some, but passes over others. The reformers um, increasingly stressed the free, unmerited grace of God in all of his actions, including salvation and election. So the real... <clears throat> controversy 
or the real question that came up was who decides who's elect? We all know there are some people that are going to heaven. There are some people that are going to hell. Everybody agrees with that. Who decides who goes where? Is it man's decision or is it God's decision? And that was the question of the Reformation. And you're going to find uh, some people on one side of that argument, some people on the other side of that argument. All right? Um, Zwingli. He really didn't stress predestination at all. But um, the plague swept through Europe. And Zwingli caught the plague. He was very, very sick for a while. And yet he recovered. God allowed him many more years. Um, and he began to think that was only because of divine will. God did that in his life. And that was probably as close as he came to an understanding of God controlling Zwingli's life and God controlling Zwingli's election, right? Um, we usually think of predestination with Calvin, but he didn't come up with it. Augustine um, taught um, predestination. In fact, Augustine taught double predestination, where some are uh, elect and some are passed over. Um, Calvin taught the same thing. I'm going all the way back to Augustine. He said, God chooses some, so it follows that God also actively willed not to save others. Was God responsible for sending them uh, to hell? No. Their sin sent them to hell. It's just that God passed them over. Calvin's main focus was uh, throughout his writings, throughout his ministry, was the revelation of the gospel of Christ. Um, predestined, predestination was important to Calvin, but for Calvin himself, it was never a central aspect of his theology. Um, he really had a different focus. He taught that the doctrine of predestination humbles the believer and brings glory to God. Nothing I did caused me to be saved. God worked it out in my life um, out of his will, out of his saving will. It's interesting if you read um, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. God, uh, Calvin places his discussion of predestination in book three. Remember, there's four books uh, in the Institutes. It's in the last half of the Institutes. He places it after his discussion of the work of Christ, after how salvation is applied to our lives, after his discussion of faith, after regeneration, after Christian life, even after his discussion of justification. Um, he begins with the objective revelation of Jesus Christ. And he only used the discussion of predestination to explain why some people respond to the gospel and some people don't. Um, Calvin said, the reason some respond and some don't is because God has elected some and not others. Um, others later on will argue the reason some people go to heaven and some people don't is because some people decide in favor of God and others reject that. Right. Um, so who's in charge? Um, is God in charge? Is man in charge? To Calvin, the doctrine of predestination was a mystery. It, it was a truth revealed in scripture. Um, he, but he said, if you're going to talk about predestination, you always have to talk about it in the context of Jesus Christ. And Calvin did, did, did that by saying, why do some people believe in Christ? and some people reject Christ. Ultimately, he said these matters fall under the inscrutable counsel of God and Christians must rest in his judgments. Why didn't God just save everybody? We don't know. We don't know. All we know is that some people aren't saved. 
and some people are. So after Calvin, Um, there's another generation of, of reformers. And it's in that generation after Calvin that election and predestination even plays a more central role in their theology. In Beza's Geneva, after Calvin, election was a dominant theme. Um, the reformers taught that Israel were elected by God and so they also said that God also elected and set apart the Reformed Church. <laughs> um, that's what they said. Um, election uh, became the, the basis of grace and the basis of change within the church, um, within society, within religion as a whole. Um, for Beza, also for Perkins, uh, a later uh, writer, uh, the doctrine of election even was linked to the Trinity. As um, that, sec that next generation developed, there were Lutheran theologians, there were what they would now be called Reformed theologians who, who were in that Calvinist camp. Um, the distinction um, with predestination uh, grew even wider. Um, the Lutherans had a different understanding of what happened than Calvinists. Um, the Westminster Confession um, treats it under the headings of God's eternal decree. Um, so if you want to learn more, um, it's quoted in, in the last part of Lesson 4 in your course materials. It's uh, Westminster Confession, Chapter 3, Articles 1 through 7. Um, but it's uh, throughout the Westminster Confession. Right. Okay, um, that's all we're going to say um, with Lesson 4. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm going to suggest that we take like a five minute break. We'll get into lesson five, where <laughs> you thought predestin predestination was a, was a touchy subject. We're going to talk about baptism. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll uh, see, how, see how things shake out uh, with that as well. All right. And that comes up in lesson five. All right. But let's take a five minute break.